Reptile Coffee Club is excited to announce our first ever round of limited edition merch. This awesome design featuring a leopard gecko basking in its natural habitat, and of course to stick with the coffee theme, a coffee field in the background. This limited edition design is only available until September 17th, so check it out now. This shirt comes with free shipping in the US, and a custom note from me, Hunter. Thank you so much for your support, shop at the link in the description. Hello everyone, welcome to Reptile Coffee Club, a live show where we host conversations with interesting voices in reptile keeping. Today we're joined by M from Emzotic, and I'll bring her on in just a minute once I do all the fun little housekeeping things and while we wait for a couple people to join. So we're live right now on YouTube, but a lot of you are probably listening tomorrow in the podcasts app. So if you want to go and catch up on either this episode or all of our previous episodes in your favorite podcasts app, you can do so at reptilecoffeeclub.com and you can easily find it from there. Thank you so much for watching our merch promo. We'll talk more about that at the end, but we're really excited for that. I'm going to bring on our co-host, Gracie. Hello, Gracie. Hi. Hi. How is everybody doing? I, yeah, I'm so glad to be here. And I think we're going to bring on, without further ado, digital animal educator, reptile content creator, and author, M from Mzotic. Hi, everyone. Hello. How's it going? Really good, thank you. Thank you both so much for inviting me to be part of your Reptile Coffee Club. I am so excited. Thank you. We're so glad to have you. So for anyone who is unfamiliar with Imzotic, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and then we'll go from there? Sure. So hi, I'm Em. I go by Emzotic on YouTube and I am a animal educator gone digital. Um, I have a background in zookeeping. I used to also own a doggy daycare and now I mostly just share all of my pet tips and uh, animal life online. Um, I'm also a published author and I have a bit of a background in horror film as well. That's awesome. Yeah, you have done so many cool things, everything from acting to writing books to teaching people about reptiles. So it's really cool, all of the things that you've done. So I guess you're most well known right now for your animals and especially your reptiles. So how did you get into keeping animals and reptiles in particular? So I actually started keeping animals um, way back when I was like 12 years old um, and I got into reptiles just like uh, Norbert the bearded dragon who you can see coming out to say hi behind me uh, because I was actually allergic, like severely allergic to animals with fur. So I was wondering what kinds of animals I could bring home to keep as pets and reptiles just kind of made sense for me. Um, it was also really helpful that I grew up in the Far East and we have so many awesome reptiles out there. Um, so I was always bringing home new family members. That's really cool. Yeah, That's you've probably seen awesome. some really cool animals in their natural habitat and then to be able to keep them as pets would be really cool. Yeah, they, they were incredible. And the great thing was is I never kept them for too long. So if I did sneak home a friend, which I don't recommend <laughs> doing, but this was right. way back in the nineties, um, I'd mm -hmm. keep them for like a day or two, then let them go exactly where I found them. Awesome. So how did you start with a job? Oh, I'm sorry, you broke up a tiny bit there. Oh no. Um, animals more professionally Um, how did I get started working with animals? Great. Um, so the way that I first started getting um, into working with animals is when I was 10, I started working at a pet store after school in order to um, make some extra money, get some pet supplies to feed my pets that I had at home. I had a very small menagerie of 
terrapins and budgies and a few other animals. So I started really young and that got me very comfortable talking to people about animals. And the person who I actually worked at this pet store with recommended me to the Hong Kong RSPCA. And that's how I started getting into rescue and rehab of dogs, which are a bit of a speciality of mine. Um, so I would go out uh, and help the adults catch um, these feral dogs that had been let go and were populating um, all over Hong Kong Island. We bring yeah. them in and then it was up to me to train them and then uh, interview people to place them in homes. Um, so that was really the beginnings for me. Wow, that's really cool. So before we move forward, I just want to tell everyone, Gracie is in Florida and right now they're having quite a like quite a storm outside so she might be a little glitchy so if so that's why and we do apologize but we're really glad that we still get to have her here at least until the storm cuts out the wi-fi or whatever <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so can you tell us a little bit about like your education background because a lot of people wanted to know if you specialized in animals in school or what you studied to be able to do the work you're doing or if you're just kind of taught by experience? Um, I am almost completely taught by experience. So I was very lucky growing up that um, I found it very easy to make connections with people and people were very giving in teaching me everything that I wanted to know. So for me, the best advice for anybody who wants to work with animals and hasn't started yet figuring out what they want to study, um, just show up. Whether you're going to a zoo or a pet store, ask questions, make connections. Um, and that's really what I did to, to get started. Um, absolutely, if you want to be, say, a veterinarian or a marine biologist, yes, you're going to require a degree. But um, everything that I've achieved so far is with very basic education and just making the right connections. That's awesome. Yeah, in the animal world, it seems like connections are everything because you may not know a specific person, but it's like the web of people being connected. You probably at least can meet someone who knows that person. And that's a great way to learn. Definitely. Hopefully I'm not too glitchy anymore. That shift to animal. So the way that I shifted into being a digital animal creator um, is that I originally used to travel all over the UK, um, sometimes traveling up to 200 or 250 miles every day with a menagerie of animals that I worked with, snakes, birds of prey, meerkats, crocodilians, armadillos, just all sorts of really awesome animals. And I realized my animals were getting tired and I was getting tired too. My days would start at 4 a.m. I was up feeding, cleaning, washing, and then packing everybody into their travel enclosures, traveling all over, setting up my set and stage at schools, museums, um, old people's homes, prisons even sometimes, and then packing it down, giving a great show, packing it down, moving on to the next location, and doing that three or four times in a day. And I just started realizing that the amount that I had to work for what I was earning and how much time out of their enclosures I was putting on my animals, um, it didn't sit right with me. And at the time, I never worked an animal two days in a row and never two consecutive days. Um, so uh, never twice, no, no more than two times a week, never two times in a row, like Monday and Tuesday. Um, so yeah, never consecutive. And even then I still knew that my animals were tired. So I just thought, can I take this digitally? Um, and I did, and it, it resonated with people and here we are. That is awesome. Yeah. It seems like you blew up really quickly on YouTube or at least compared to a lot of creators. Can you tell us about like what your first couple videos were? Because I think I've been watching since the giant African land snail video. Sure. So um, my first real animal video, I believe, was the cockroach video that I put up. That was a like an introduction to keeping Madagascan hissing cockroaches as pets. 
And at the time, I don't think anybody had really created a video on YouTube. At least, I don't know if women had. Um, and it was a very strange video for a lot of people because even though I was just talking about something that was very normal for me and my passion, my setup was very typical of the YouTube era. I was in my bedroom. I had my bed behind me. I had a string of fairy lights. It was like very Zoella-esque, except uh. for cockroaches. <laughs> so <laughs> kind of intrigued people and it made people subscribe and want to see more because I'd tell people I'd come back and I'd share more of my animals. And then I came back with these animals that I knew nobody else had really shared so far, such as Shrek, my giant African land snug. He's as big as my face. And he's yeah. still alive. He slash she, because they're hermaphrodites, um, is still alive and being taken care of in England by a friend of mine who's also an animal educator. But those are really my breakout videos. Yeah, that was really cool. Thank you. Now, I now have over a hundred, over half a million subscribers on. Um, oh no! And you definitely have. Gracie, have, I think you are cutting out again. <laughs> and, uh, okay, <laughs> you take over for me. Yeah, for sure. So I think we're. <laughs> Yeah, I think where Gracie was going with this is you have over 100,000 followers and over half a million subscribers on YouTube. And that definitely gives you the power to greatly influence people's, like the way that they care for their pets. What are some things that you do to make sure that being a responsible influencer and what are some things that other like animal influencers can do to make sure they're being responsible as well? So that's a really good question. I really had to pick my brain just there. Like, what am I doing or what have I done to be responsible? And I think there's a very, very fine line to tread between being entertaining and educational, which is why I call my my channel like edutaining. Um, I like but, that. <laughs> thank you. Um, but what I do try and do is to make sure that people know that these are not just an animal that I buy for the camera, that's not fair at all. These are animals that I've looked after for a very long time. Um, I intend to keep them, or at least the vast majority of them, if I don't have a plan for them to go off to somebody else um, for the, the vast majority of their life. Um, and I try and let people know that these, these animals, whilst they are a small part of our lives, we are their entire existence. And it's, there's nothing worse than going hungry or thirsty. So people have to really think, can I commit to an animal, feed it, house it, um, give it medical care? And something that I've pushed very hard on my channel is if you can't afford the vet, then don't get the pet. Because I see so many people buying exotic animals for a relatively low price at a pet store or um, from a rescue even, and then realizing that the ongoing costs far outweigh the cost of essentially buying the animal. So I try and make the cost very realistic. And I also try and show the truth about how many of these animals don't even actually like me that much. I mean, Norbert, <laughs> Norbert loves me. He thinks that I'm like the sunshine, which is great. Um, mm -hmm. I'm a bug giver more than anything. Uh, but <laughs> there's a lot of reptiles and animals that I've kept over the years that don't necessarily like me. So yeah. I don't want to portray um this false narrative where people go like you're the, the real snow white like i'm not because snow white was friends with all of her animals not all the animals are <laughs> they don't like me all that much all the time and that's okay so i want to manage expectations and let people know that an exotic animal is still in many ways a wild animal even if they were born in captivity and we can't expect them all to love us and treat us the way that our puppy would that's very true. I feel like a lot of people almost think of their dogs or, or excuse me, their reptiles or speak of them as if they are dogs or something that's been domesticated for hundreds or thousands of years. But we, I think it's definitely important that we keep in mind that these are, at the end of the day, still exotic or wild animals and we need to think of them as such. Definitely. Um, so that's something I like to be realistic about um there's nothing about keeping exotics that's easy 
It comes with huge expenses. It can be very heartbreaking at times, especially people will know this if they followed the saga of Grinchy, my old red billed hornbill on my channel. It took me two years to acclimate him from being a wild caught bird, which I would never in encourage anyone to do. Just don't buy wild caught birds. And it can be difficult to tell because they are for sale in many pet stores. But I knew he was well caught and I struck a deal with the pet store that if they gave him to me at cost and didn't get any more of the species in, then I would take him on because they were struggling too. Um, mm -hmm. And they agreed and they haven't done it since. We, I have a really good relationship with that pet store now and they use me as a consultant, which is great. Um, but even still, that was a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of heartache. And in the end, I couldn't save Grinchy from the bacterial infections he kept on getting because he's not used to the bacteria that we have in captivity. So yeah. it can come with a lot of heartache keeping exotics. And it's something everybody should be aware of. Yeah, that's very true. It's something that I'm glad you did share that journey, the journey of Grinchy, so that people know kind of what to anticipate and no, like don't go get a wild caught hornbill or anything like that. So like, thank you for being a responsible example of someone who's sharing their pet keeping online. Thank you, I, I'm trying. I don't always get it right. There's plenty that I look back on in my videos and go, oh, are you sure? Um, but <laughs> you live and you learn and you grow. Absolutely, that's the Absolutely. most important thing. Absolutely. You've done a lot in the world of pet keeping, everything from working in animal rescues, like you said, where you got your start to being an influencer. What are kind of all of the things that you have done? Like if you could walk us through that career path that you've taken. Okay, let's start at the beginning and I'll try and rapid fire it. From the age right. of 10 to 11, I was working in a regular pet store. And then from 11 till 14, I was rehabilitating dogs at the Hong Kong RSPCA. And then I moved to the UK to finish my studies. And I did a little bit of small pet sitting from my bedroom, hamsters, gerbils, parakeets, things like that. Um, and then I became an animal educator after, after meeting somebody on a film set, because I was working as an actress, um, who handled exotic animals for film and TV purposes. And they brought me on board, they trained me, and I became a trainee, sort of like an entry level animal tech at one of the largest private collections of exotic animals in the UK. And then from there, I sort of honed my craft and paired up my background in film and TV and theater with my animal knowledge that I had just gained over the years. Um, and then that was when I became a traveling animal educator uh, with a company called the Mobile Menagerie, which was I was a co-owner in. Um, I then, once I had startup money, I opened my own doggy daycare, which was a very bougie doggy daycare. We all had little bandanas, all the dogs would wear them every day. Um, <laughs> I was making a mint. That's probably the best I've ever been paid. Um, I charged like $50 a dog every day, had about oh 20 gosh. dogs. Um, and I was constantly like selling extras as well. It was very lucrative. I loved it. I was treating people's dogs the way that I would want my dog to be treated. So that was very successful. And when it got to a point that I was having difficulty scaling the business um, and finding people who would give that attention to detail that I was giving to these dogs, I sold it. Um, and then I actually moved to the United States just as my videos started going viral on YouTube. Um, but I actually missed out as a zookeeper as well in there as well for about <laughs> years. I was a zookeeper um, at a zoo in the United Kingdom. I won't say which one because the relationship turned a bit sour at the end, but it was a very good learning experience. And I realized that if I'm gonna work with animals, I want to be the one in charge of the animals, not the one caring for the animals that I have no real say over. Um, there were some frustrations there for me uh, in terms of the budget not being properly allocated. And that's uh, when I started alongside my animal education and the dog daycare, putting out my YouTube videos, working, editing, not sleeping, just pushing my videos as much as possible. And um, I then moved to the United States. That's where Emzotic really started to take off because it became my full-time work. 
Um, and that's when I started getting these brand deals for say my jewelry that I created where a percentage went to helping to save the bees. Um, I was able to do lots of different appearances um, just on like live TV and things like that. Then I wrote my own book. Um, and now I'm also working with a great company that I adore. It's uh, Zen Habitats who create all of the habitats behind me. I'm currently their director yeah. of partnerships. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of cool things going on. That's really cool. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's awesome how you have so much experience and I'm sure that guides your personal reptile keeping. Can you tell us a little bit about like what di different like tidbits of information or experience you've gained from different experiences that you've had and how that kind of guides your reptile keeping? Yes, there is no one animal I've ever kept where everything went by the book and the way that I was told it was going to by care sheets or mentors. So the most important thing that I've learned is to be as creative as possible and as open to suggestion, but also understanding that every animal is individual. Um, so I've just really tried my best to learn and to recontribute what I've learned um, and also to question things. There's a lot of old information on the internet and also people who have kept animals for a long time in a certain way and haven't really pivoted because their animals have survived for a long time. And that's why they think that they might be doing things the right way, but they're still keeping animals in, in my opinion, subpar enclosures and feeding mm -hmm. a subpar diet. So definitely question things. Um, and I've, I've learned that no matter how many people do things differently, whether you prefer naturalistic setups, tubs or anything else, we're all animal lovers and you can't expect to push a cart sideways. So just try and lead by example rather than yelling at people that they are wrong. Yeah, that's very true. It seems like um, all of us pet YouTubers have probably experienced that at one point or another. We've um, just speaking from my personal experience, it definitely works better when you try to lead by example instead of like, for example, when I do an enclosure review video, if I see something that I don't necessarily like, I'll say like, hey, I would suggest you change this and then give them an example of what to do instead of kind of degrading what they have done, if that makes sense. Yes. And as a creator, um, for all of us, everybody who has a social platform and keeps animals and shares their lives with animals and their experiences, there always comes a time when the pressure is put on to call people out or to do something different in your care. And whilst we should be critical and be open to constructive feedback, just remember like too many chefs in the kitchen can ruin a good thing. So if you're having good success, your animals are healthy, you do believe that they are truly thriving and not just surviving, then don't worry that your crested gecko is in like a two foot by two foot by two foot rather than an eight foot that someone else might right. say. Like, minimum in their opinion so you know just just do what you feel is right for your animals and and do it to the best of your ability yeah absolutely especially yeah especially since like every animal is an individual you have to customize that care to them so um my idea of the perfect bearded dragon enclosure might not look like your idea or someone else's idea exactly so kind of hinging on the differences in people's opinions of care. You have kept reptiles in different countries, and so you probably have seen the differences in care between at least the US and the UK, if not other places. Could you tell us about some of those differences? Yes, so overall, the minimum space requirements, which I really hate to talk about because I don't think there should be a minimum space requirement. Um, it should be should be thinking about what's the most that I have to give to an animal and what animal mm -hmm. is what I can give rather than what can I cram this animal in that I can get away with. Um, for me, the minimum space requirements in the UK, along with a lot of the welfare laws, have surpassed those here in the United States. But 
I do feel that the United States is starting to catch up in many ways and also excel because there's per capita more reptile keepers here who are trying different things. So it's really an exciting thing to have seen the way that things are done in the UK and then to see how amazingly well things are starting to flourish here for reptiles as well. And I do attribute a lot of this to very bold creators who share. Um, there are a lot of creators out there who have blown my mind with the way they keep their animals and lead by example. I mean, Serpa Design Tanner is incredible. I had the very good fortune of meeting him just a couple of days ago at Animal Con, which was a great experience overall. Um, so that's been really interesting. And I've also seen, of course, the not so great things. Um, I did grow up, grow up in the Far East and there are still a lot of very outdated ways that people keep their animals. Um, I, I spoke on a panel at Animal Con about my introduction to turtles and how I brought home a turtle in my first ever red ear slider was in an ice cream tub, which was empty with water all the way up to the top and one tiny little red ear slider that could not stand up in it. And that was what I was keeping it in. And then I realized it was tired. So I started to do a little bit more research and I realized, hey, they have to be able to come out of the water. They have to be able to take a breath and not fully aquatic. So um, very interesting growing up there as well. And I'm glad that the, a lot of the stigmas and outdated information is starting to change there as well. But it's still a challenge every time I go back um, just to see how reptiles are kept in Asia is very different. But as with every group of people and people who are hobbyists, there are also really outstanding people as well who have incredible animals and setups I can only dream of out there too. So it depends. There's good people and bad people and good keepers and bad keepers everywhere you go. Yeah, absolutely. It's really interesting to hear about the diversity of different animal care methods and how, you know, some people have like, in Florida, for example, fully outdoor enclosures, and then people might have, like in Wyoming, where I used to live, that would not be an option, or Colorado, where you live, it would get too cold. So it's really interesting to see how people are able to use the different resources that they have around them to do something completely different that can still work for the animal, even though it is completely different. Definitely. So... Um, you've worked with a lot of individual animals and I'm sure that you've bonded with a lot of them, but is there one in particular that you would say has made the most lasting impact on you? Yes. Um, probably one of the animals that has had the most lasting impact on me would be Kashmir, my Indian fruit bat. Um, so back when I was living in the UK and working with all these wonderful different exotic mammals, my favorites by far were the Indian fruit bats. Now they're the size of like a bowling pin and they have almost a four, four foot wingspan almost. They are stunning. They are a treat for all the senses, including the nose. They're, they're quite <laughs> fragranced, I should say. Um, but he was one of my favorite bats because... Um, he would fly to me on shows. Like that was pretty much unheard of. The the bats were very friendly. Uh, we would pick bats from this uh, establishment once they were born. You would raise them. So for about a year, I would have a bat under my sweater um, and just like attached to like like a head. You know those headbands? <laughs> They're just like a regular headband. I put one around my neck and it was stretchy. <laughs> have the bat hanging underneath it and like under my shirt so for about a year people would see this happening to my shirt and like just <laughs> I was a bit smelly at the time because like the bats just have a smell um oh, but it was worth it for me to have that like wonderful bond with a, a giant african um giant indian fruit bat um and he was great you know he really just had this really foxy dog-like face and features and yeah. even my dog now reminds me so much of him that I think of Kashmir all the time. Yeah, absolutely. And someone on here just commented um, that there are so many memorable, memorable animals that you've worked with. And of course, Grinchy, I'd say anyone in the Creature Crew, which for those of you unfamiliar is M's group of subscribers, um, I'd say that that's probably the most memorable animal that we've seen you work with just because we really did see the highs and the lows. And so 
Like that's one that whenever I'm at a zoo and I see a hornbill, even if it's not a yellow-billed hornbill, I always think of Grinchy. Thank you. Yeah, he was great. And thank you, Lucky Smith, for, for joining us today. I can see all of your comments and um, Geeky Gecko Creations and Neil Chase and Bunny, Bunny Sunshine, Katie. I, I can see you all. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you all for being here. So right now you are in Colorado, which is, in my opinion, one of the most beautiful states, especially in the mountains and stuff. Do you think you're going to stay there for a long time or do you think you're going to kind of move about the country? I don't know if I'll stay, to be honest with you. I um, I came out here after escaping domestic violence and it was a great place to heal. It's a wonderful growing city. I love the mountains, but it's the first time in my life that I've been landlocked ever. Mm. I've only ever lived on the coast or um, in, in, in islands, essentially. I mean, the, the UK is technically an island, Hong Kong's an island, and then uh, I lived in Jersey for all, which has the Jersey Shore, of course. I never realized how much I would miss the ocean. And I'm not a beach bum or anything like that. I, I just like to be able to know that there's an end to the land mass. So I don't know if I will stay. I do love it here, but I kind of am getting my my nomadic uh my nomadic feet tingling that i tend to get after being in one place for too long yeah absolutely it's cool that you have a job where you are a digital animal educator so you that digital part is a key you're able to move around and have that freedom that's really cool it is pretty cool so let's kind of pivot and talk about animal kind so um i'll share my little um, piece of information about that book. Um, when I first read that book, I made like, I think it was an Instagram review of it or something. And that's, I think when you first followed my account. And so I rewatched it a couple days ago, preparing for this. And it always cracked me up or like it cracks me up just seeing the change in video quality and stuff. But your book is really awesome. And so for anyone who's unfamiliar with it, would you share a little bit about that? Yes, absolutely. Uh, my book is called Animal Kind. Um, the author is Emma Locke. That's me. Um, it's actually available on Amazon if you wanted to go and check it out. And it is a compilation of stories inspired by true stories and true people who contributed their stories very bravely to this book. And it's all about the relationships between humans and our pets and how they impact us in many amazing and magical and wonderful ways. Um, the format of the book is I've told everybody's story. And at the very end of each chapter, there's a little fact file about the animals that I've spoken about in that chapter, along with a picture of the real life person and the animal that actually inspired that story. Yeah, it, it was really well written. And I think it really did illustrate very well how like an animal can really make that bond with you and truly improve your life. So it was awesome. Thank you. Um, so for anyone who hasn't read it, it shares the story of a dog, a conure, an ador or like an awesome red foot tortoise, who that was my favorite chapter, and then bear, M's ferret, and then a horse. So it, yeah, like it has an animal for anyone. And it was published kind of right at the start of the pandemic. So I feel like it provided a lot of comfort. But at the same time, I'm sure that's probably not the most exciting time to be publishing a book. So how did that affect how the book launch went? So literally the day after I published that book on Amazon, Amazon ceased all orders and deliveries for anything that wasn't an essential item like tissues or hand sanitizer or N95 masks. So my sales did not reach what I was hoping, but people still came through. And a lot of people, even though some canceled orders, most stuck it out and they just said, if I have to wait 30, 60, 90 days, I'm still purchasing. And I cried about it for about 10 minutes. And then I thought, suck it up. You can do some good with this. So I took um, a percentage from every single book and every single book helped to fund um, supplies for frontline um, COVID uh, workers. 
Oh, that's really cool. I didn't even realize that. That makes it wow. e like an even more impactful book. Thank you. Yeah. Gracie, I think you're back. We can hear you now. Hi, Gracie. Oh, good. Um, um, hopefully I don't start. Um, um, so writing a book. Yeah, what was that like writing a book? Um, very challenging in many ways because although I love writing and I love reading, um, just the circumstances under which I was writing the book was very, very difficult. Uh, my marriage was falling apart very rapidly. It was a very tumultuous and toxic time in my life. And it was very, very difficult to feel creative and inspired when I felt like I was living in a prison and in a bit of a nightmare. But the book helped to keep me sane because I could just sneak off quietly to my room and a lot of animal kind was written in the notes app of my phone under the covers while I listened to my favorite classical music. So I'm very proud of the book because at one point somebody looked me straight in the eye and said, you're never finishing that book. And I just remember Aww. thinking, yes, I will. And I did. Yeah, that really shows your strength that even in such a difficult time in your life, you were able to write a book which ended up being like, wasn't it a bestseller in the animals category? It was, it was um, under a teens, zoolo uh, zoological and something else. It was a bestseller in multiple categories for a couple of weeks. That is really cool. Yeah, like that just shows your strength, how you were able to write such an incredible book that really, like you poured your heart into it, especially the chapter about bear when you were going through something like that. So thank you for doing that. Oh, thank you. And, and for anybody who has read it or even just shared a post about it, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate it. You helped to make my dreams come true. Yeah. So now that you're an author and you have one book under your belt, do you have any plans to write any more books? Yes. I have recently had a meeting with Mango Publishing. We are discussing Animal Kind 2, but awesome. it's going to be slightly different because whereas Animal Kind 1 focused on people who I knew from real life, I'd like to throw it out to my followers, my creature crew, and my subscribers and to work with them collaboratively to tell their stories. Oh, that's incredible. That'll be really cool because you can get a variety of perspectives and hear from people all around the world. Definitely. I'm so excited for that. Yeah. What has that been like having so many people in the Creature Crew? Um, I'm sure you've made some really incredible connections. Can you tell us about like some of the great experiences that this has provided you? Definitely. I mean, obviously, going into all these different creator events, you meet awesome people who are standouts in the community, um, just like at Animal Con earlier this week for me. Um, but what I really love the most is, is meeting those who watch my videos and who are like, you know, I've never even commented, but I felt compelled to come out and meet you just to say thank you because you know, you helped me through a difficult time or really what has touched me so much, what I've literally hugged and cried people over at events is when they say, you being brave enough to speak out about how anybody can be affected by domestic violence made me realize that I didn't have to stay. And I've met so many people, I wanna say at least 30 people who have told me that they've now left their awful situations and are recovering or are recovered um, from domestic violence. And that's just something that I would love to continue working towards is creating um, uh, different kinds of merch and products that will go towards helping to fund those looking to escape domestic violence, but who can't because they're afraid of leaving their animals behind. So that's really inspired me through meeting these amazing and, and very, very courageous people. Wow, yeah, that's really awesome. Um, and then I guess Animal Con, that was another place you probably got to meet some awesome members of the Creature Crew. How was that? I 
heard that it was a great time, but I want to hear like your experience. It was, I was blown away. You know, when you go to any kind of animal expo or con, you don't really know what to expect because animal people are also different and diverse. And mm. truthfully, there were some creators there that I was like, ooh, do I, do I agree with them? Do I want to hang out with them? And I realized without exception, like not a single person that I met at least was anything but kind and humble and and had a great energy and everybody pulled together to make it the best animal event I think I've ever been to in my entire life. And I, it made me realize that everybody's mission is different. Every animal person on the internet has something that their audience resonates with for them and we all want the same thing. So it made me, it, it was very humbling and very enlightening at the same time. That's awesome. Yeah. So everyone, Gracie, I think, is going to sign off because the storm is getting worse and her Wi-Fi is also getting worse. So thank you so much for being here, Gracie. And I think I will just wrap it up by asking you, Em, about your future animal breeding plans, because I know you have some really cool animals, including crested geckos, um, snakes from the Ganyasoma genus. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure thing. Well, first of all, Gracie, thank you so much. You're a rock star for staying on as long as you did. So thank you. Um, and yes, I have started a business called Ruckus Reptiles. It's just a small time reptile breeding business. Um, and it's with creating like high quality, healthy animals in mind. So right now I'm starting with crested geckos because crested geckos are always in demand and they're so cute. And I think they're a great like reptile for people to keep as like a first time reptile I'm not saying that they're a beginner animal but for a first time animal a uh, reptile i think that they're very forgiving so yeah. i love geckos but really my passion when it comes to breeding is trying to take the strain off of wild populations of asian species of animal so for example when i go into any expo or pet store i can often see uh, Chinese water dragons and they are not good pets by any stretch of the mind just don't do it if you're thinking about they're very very difficult but I see so many being imported on mass and most of them die um, they get ridden with parasites they stress easily um, their face rub can be extremely detrimental to their health so I want to at least have a couple of um, uh, different Asian species like the Chinese water dragons every year so that those who are willing to put in the work that it takes to keep these animals are getting off on the right foot with uh, a healthy captive bred specimen. Um, mm -hmm. Along the same lines, I'm very into my rat snakes. Um, so the red-tailed green rat snakes, uh, that is uh, Goniosoma oxycephalum. Very interesting. In my mind, they make a better display snake than an emerald tree boa or a green tree python or an Amazon tree boa. Um, it's just very spicy and very feisty, which I also like in my snakes. So they're very interesting to me. But again, it's an animal that's brought in from the wild en masse and most of them die. And I'd love to take some strain off of wild populations. And then the ones I'm most excited about are my Goniosoma frenatum. And this mm -hmm. is she's that hardly anybody keeps and I, I it took me the longest time to find anybody who would even be able to import them for me from Germany so I recently imported two of these snakes that also known by their common name the rain snake not like rain as in this rain as in like the rains of a <laughs> r-e-i-n uh, rain snakes they're beautiful they max out at about three feet um, they're a beautiful rat snake that can be either a powder blue or a teal color. Um, very, very beautiful snake and, and pretty forgiving actually as a species as well. And I'd love to see more of them uh, being represented in captivity. Yeah, I have only seen them um, on photos and videos, of course, and mainly only on your account. So I'm, I think that's really awesome that you're bringing attention to them. I was able to see my first Ganyasoma oxycephalum in person last, or I guess it's been a couple of months now at Schaumburg, and they are just absolutely gorgeous. Um, I love how that genus, kind of when they flick out their tongue, it stays there for a while. They kind of, it hangs out. 
It does. So most things you just see this like, blah, 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 blah. whereas with them, it's like a. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's kind of <laughs> cute. And then, of course, with um, oxycephalum, so the red tailed green rat snakes, um, they have an electric blue tongue, which is just it's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that genus is just so fascinating. And they're one that in the future, when I have room for like a huge display enclosure, they're at the top of my list. Absolutely. Oh, they're great. You're going to have so much fun with them. <laughs> yeah. Well, I want to thank you so much for joining us and sharing so much with us today. Um, I think this was a really awesome interview and I hope everyone watching enjoyed it as well. Yeah, and thank you so much for having me and for everybody who has joined us and watched, whether silently or contributing with comments as well. I can see that Lucky Smith just said that rain snakes are gorgeous. You're so right. You are so right. I feel you on that. Um, and thank you all so much for joining in. They, um, This is such a great podcast. I love the idea of the reptile coffee club. Like, that's so awesome. It's just so like cozy and wholesome. I was like, I have to be a part of this. Um, so definitely. <laughs> go and check out Reptile Coffee Club on all the socials. Awesome, thank you so much. Yeah, I have like a coffee obsession. And so I'm like, I'll just pair together my two favorite things and then boom, Reptile Coffee Club was born. <laughs> there you go, and your merch looks great. The leopard gecko with the coffee fields, ah, oh, genius, I love it. You do things so well, Hunter. I really appreciate it. And I wanna thank you for your support over the years. Oh, you're so welcome. I'm gonna be here, I'll be a, a lifer, a ride or die for you. I know you're gonna achieve incredible things. You already have. I'm just excited to see what you what you do with the Reptile Coffee Club and, and beyond. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much, and I'll talk to you later, Em. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Once again, everyone, thank you so much for watching. Be sure to follow um follow Em from Em Zotic. All of her socials will be linked in the description. Um, huge thank you to Gracie. Gracie, I know you said you were going to tune in on YouTube once you had to leave because of the storm. And I just want to thank you for being such a trooper. I That really sucks that the storm messed up with you, up your Wi-Fi. But I want to thank you for your willingness to try to stick it out. And everyone, once again, go check out that Reptile Coffee Club merch. I'm going to play the little preview that we made for it on the way out. So you can watch that before you go. And definitely... Just thank you so much for being here. This was a great time. Reptile Coffee Club is excited to announce our first ever round of limited edition merch. This awesome design featuring a leopard gecko basking in its natural habitat, and of course to stick with the coffee theme, a coffee field in the background. This limited edition design is only available until September 17th, so check it out now. This shirt comes with free shipping in the US, and a custom note from me, Hunter. Thank you so much for your support. Shop at the link in the description.